everyone. Today I would like to introduce our new paper on the statistics efficiency of the machine learning based numerical PDE solvers. This talk is about a fast rate generalization bound and a discussion about the neural skewing law of the uh, machine learning based uh, uh, numerical PDE solvers and to discuss whether these solvers are optimal. This is a joint work with Hao Xuan Chen, Jianfeng Lu, Lai Xin Yin, and Jose Blanket. So the motivation of this work is to solving a high dimensional PDE, which has wide applications in material science and quantum physics. If you want to use a finite element method on a regular grid, it's impossible to solve the high dimensional PDE because the grid size is always exponential in D. So the only thing I can do in high dimension is I draw some random samples and solving the PDE using these random drawn samples. So it's a very natural question to ask, what is the statistics uh, efficiency of the machine learning based PDE solvers? So let's consider this very simple P, uh, PDE. This is a very standard uh, elliptic PDE. And we set the boundary condition. In, in my talk, I will set the boundary condition to become zero directory boundary condition as a simple case, but you can do more. Okay, so our question is how many random samples I needed uh, then I can solve the PDE very efficiently. Okay, so to solve this PDE, recent years, several objective functions have been proposed. The first one is like, I just uh, minimizing the residue of the solution of my PDE. It is also considered as you can minimize in the strong form of the PDE. Okay, so this is called physics informed neural network or deep Galloping method. So if there is also other ways to use a weak form, so you can have a test function and you automax a max uh, or test function to see whether your PD have been sold. So this is again like method and uh, it's a mini max objective. So I will not talk about it today in this work. Okay, I will also use a, but for the PD problem is uh, it have another different story is that you can use the variational form like the if you want to solve the Laplace equation, then you can minimize the uh, square of your gradients, right? So this is called decrease method. And I will discuss the rate for the pin and the decrease method in my talk. Once you have these objective functions, you will always find out that all of these all, all objective functions are integral over the high dimensional spaces. So we can write it down in an expectation sense so that you can write down the corresponding empirical laws. Then we, what we need to investigate it is that the error between the empirical laws and the population laws were like something like one over square root of your number, uh, the, the number of data you draw. And uh, you will also have a class of functions like the capital F here is a function class you, you selected. Then because the function class is not all the functions in the sublet space, so you will always have approximation error. So then you will have approximation error and this empirical to population generalization error. So in this talk, I will, to, I will show you how I can balance these two errors to get the rate of the convergence of the PDE, uh, sorry, the rate of convergence of the PDE solvers respected to the number of data I draw. So the function space I'm most interested in is actually the neural network function space. But here, because some technical issue, I, I, I just consider that a very, very, uh, I can say not standard or standard in theory, but not standard in, in practice. It is like I'm considering a sparse neural network. It is saying that my neural network's weight has sparse. I just have S weights are not, are not zero and all my weights are bounded by B. But in the practice, I, I think it's not the functional class we used. So I will show you that this function class is not optimal for decrease method, but I'm not saying that the neural network may not be optimal. Okay. So uh, recent work have shown that if you want to train a neural network to solve a classification problem, they will discover a dimension dependent neural scaling law. So what's the neural scaling law saying is that if you draw figures about the x axis here is the log of training data and the log of number of the training data and the y axis here is the log of your test loss. Then you will get a very, very beautiful, beautiful straight line here. It is saying that your log log curve is actually a straight line. If you estimated the slope of the, this straight line 
uh, respected to different dimensions, like a five dimension here, six dimension here, seven dimension is, uh, and up to 10 dimension. And if you, uh, and, uh, and you plot the inverse of your slope. So the inverse of your slope with the dimension, then you'll get another straight line. It is saying that, okay, my loss, my, tr my test loss may come, may, may become n alpha power, and then the alpha is proportional to the inverse of your dimension. So this is discovered by this paper for the uh, classification task. But in, in this paper, I will see that, I will show you that, oh, okay, the figure here is actually drawn by myself and it is for the PDE solvers. So the neural scaling law for, for, for you can also have a neuro, very good neural scaling law for PDEs here. So can I show this neural scaling law in theory? I think it's doable and I will show you how I can do this. And uh, what one always says that the neural network can break the curse of dimensionality. So how it happens? So now I, the function I showed here is actually a two very, very simple functions. The first one is generated by a random neural teacher. And the second one is a very, very simple um, polynomial. And in this time, if you plot this log log curve, what you will show that it is the, the slope of it is actually exactly 0 0.5. It is saying that the approximation error is very small then my neural network can adapt it to this very simple function spaces. Then you will get a curse of dimension, a, a, a break the curse of dimensionality and get a rating dependent of your dimension. So I think this is the, a, a good adaptation of the function spaces I constructed. So before the talk, I, I tell you how I prove it. I will show you the result I, I get. So for the uh, ping method, I, I will show you that it's very easy to get a, a matching upper and a lower bound like what ha would have been shown in the function estimation uh, theory. So it is like, because you are minimizing a strong form, it is a very, looks like uh, you are minimizing a, a least square problem and you will get your, so you can just do the same proof as a function estimation. But for the deep freeze method, the story will become different. So for the standard deep freeze method, what we all show that your deep freeze method is actually not tight. It is like the upper bound is worse than the lower bound. And, and, and uh, for neural network, I can't say I have give you a tight proof, but for the free basis, I will show you that this bound is actually tight. And there is also, we also propose a modified version of the deep freeze method that it is optimal. Okay, so this deep freeze method is optimal for free basis, but for the neural network, I still can't tell you that it's optimal or not. It's just like I can't achieve the optimal rate. So, also, this rate can be done for graph Laplacians, and uh, this is an ongoing work. So, let me first show you the lower bound. Okay, the, what's the lower bound saying? It is a minimax optimal, uh, optimality bound. So because it's a very standard notation in statistics, but not a standard notation in numerical PD community. So I will tell you what's the, this bound saying. This bound is saying that I consider all the estimators. What's all the estimators? It's a mapping from N data to a function in the Sobolev space. So once you have all the estimator here, you can always find out a function U. It is saying that you have an estimator as an example, if I, I why I need this supremum over the function spaces, if I, if I just give you one function, then you can always have an estimator, no, no matter what's your input, I just output this function, right? So you, you should say that the lower bound is in a spaces. So in the minimax way, it is saying that, um, uh, I have all, all the estimators. I can always find out a function. You, if you give me the estimator, I can tell you a function. So for this function, your estimator will always get the error like this. Okay, so, so our, our bound is shown for the standard PDE, but actually you can do this for S order PDE learned in HT norm. Okay, so if you do that, that the the ace, the ace, the order of the PDE will appears here, and the T is the evaluation norm. The evaluation norm will appears here. So this is the bound you get. And for this equation, let's see. So the bound here is for deep freeze method because the deep freeze method, what you have is the square of your it is the square of your gradients. So so the norm here will become the Sobolev 
like the first gradient, right? So the sublevel one norm. So your rate will become two, two here and four here. So if, if you are a pin method, you are minimizing it according to a strong form. The strong form have two gradients. So, so what you get is actually the H2 norm. So, so the bound you have is like the four here is the, it's because it's the same is because of the order of the PDE and here is not minus two, but you will get a minus four. Okay, so there's also another very simple way to consider why this lower bound happens. It is like, okay, so if I want to solve a second order PDE in the H1 norm, so the, I can have an estimator. It is like, I, I, I estimate my F very accurately, right? So I can, I can reduce my estimator from estimating a function to a function estimator. Like if once you gives you, I can use this PDE to write down the F. So once you have a PD estimators, I can get a very good estimator for F. And for the F, what's the norm here? So because the U is H1 norm and the PDE is the uh, second order PDE, the norm on your F is actually the H minus one norm, right? So the lower bound here is actually exactly the norm, exactly the lower bound that if you want to estimate F in the H minus one norm. Okay, there is another view to understand this bound. And for the S order PDE learning HT norm, it is like you, you need to learn this F in that strange norm. And, uh, and because why you have this alpha minus four here is because you, uh, what I assumed is that the U, the solution of the PDE, the solution of the PDE is appears in H alpha space, then my F will, will lie in the alpha minus two space. So that's why my uh, my dominator here is always depend on the on the PD on the PD's order and my uh, and here I will always depend on my norm. So this is the reason why I, ha I have this bound. Okay. So the way to prove it is using a standard final method. The final method is saying that I can turn solving a PDE into a testing problem. It is saying what he said it is like I if I can accurately solve the Z the PDE, I can always give you a classification task. The classification task is saying that I have two PDEs. The two PDEs, they have some difference. Then I can tell you, I give you a data sample from one PDE, then you can tell me the data from a, a, a which one. If you can't do this, so if you, if you can solve the PDE accurately, this classification task is actually very simple. So, so, the idea here is like turning the solving PDE into a multi, multiple hypothesis testing problem. And then we use the standard final method to prove it. And the function space is de designed very, very similar to what it's done in the part. Okay, so our lower bound is actually very easily can be attended to the linear PDEs. Uh, we only need the order of your derivatives. And uh, I think most of the scientific computing problems, we should develop some, uh, develop some lower bound there. So as an example, for the sampling method, uh, you can have lower, lower bound. And for estimating normalizing constant, I know for these two problems, they have lower bound. And for solving motion MP equation, optimal transport there is also have been built very good lower bound. But for other problems, I didn't know. Okay, so, but for the for solving the PDE, there is also one thing I need to say because I'm using the final method. I always use my query to become noisy. It is saying that what I get is not exactly the function value, but a noisy version of it. So uh, in in the final method proof, it's very hard to move the noise here. But as actually in the PDE, uh, in many cases, we doesn't consider whether there is noise or not. So maybe for some applications, we should consider some new lower bound. Okay, and uh, for the upper bound, for the upper bound, I have said I can decompose the error into approximation error and then generalization error. I just have this figure here to tell you to to tell to like maybe this is not standard in Morocco PDE community, so I will uh, very quickly talk about it. So the 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 gray the gray circle here is all the functions uh, I in my in my space of the estimators. And the, the U star here is the, your, your true solution. Then I can always decompose the error into two parts. The first part is that you will project your U star into your estimators and then this one is the approximation error. And the, 
this one is 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 a uh, is the projection in the population loss, but this one is actually solved using an empirical version. So these two operators E and E N have some error. So then the U F and the U hat here will, will have some distance. Okay, and and this gray circle you can consider it as a neural network and a truncated Fourier basis in my talk. So the previous papers already done this general uh, uh, approximation and generalization decomposition and it gives you a very good bounds, but here it, it is the but the, but what they get is actually approximation plus the one over square root of n bound. Okay, so why they have this is it is saying that my E N and E, these two operators, because you are using a central limit theorem, maybe a uniform central limit theorem there. So the rate here is one over square root n of one of square root of n. But this is not optimal. I will tell you if you write down their bound here, you will find a huge gap there. So in this talk, the first thing I will tell you is that in the statistics, there is always a literature saying that if you if your objective function satisfies the Brinstein condition, then you can have a fun, you can have a faster rate. So our function now here is actually a strongly convex function, or like the e, the the e energy here is actually the square of your PD, is square of your distance here. So it is a just strongly convex objective. So you will always have a one over m fast rate generalization bound. Okay, so. If you are plugging the fast rate generalization bound, is it optimal? Is it the next thing I will discuss? Okay, the motive are very simple motivating example for, for one doesn't know this fast rate bound, it can be these very simple examples. So I want to estimate a mean of the distributions via the L2 loss. Then the estimator will give you the empirical mean. Using the chain of bound, you will know that the, the actually the estimator you get is one over square root of n. But because our loss is a square square loss, then the loss in convergence will give you a one over n rate. So if you do a concentration bound on the L, because the L can also be right be written in the in, in this empirical way using the L2 loss. If you do a if you do a concentration bound on L, then you will get a suboptimal bound because you will get one over square root of n, as what they done in the previous papers. To have this bound is actually a very simple. The idea here is that I'm using the Brinstein inequality instead of the chain of in, in, inequality. Because if you once you use the Brinstein inequality, the square root of n, you know that the constant here is your variance. And uh, using the strongly convex condition, you can link your loss with your variance. Sorry, so I think here you should have an inverse sign here. It, it's larger than not smaller than. So 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 if you if you have the square root of variance, then you can plug out your loss variance here as your loss, then you will have this inequality. Then you can have a very fast uh, one over n bound. Okay, this, this has been done for neural network to estimate a function in these papers. They have done it for holder space, for base of space, for mixed smooth space of space. The mixed smooth space of space is actually something, a combination of Base of space with a sparse grid, and also for some uh, input data lies on low dimensional structures. So the idea here to get the optimal rate is that you, uh, the n here is actually the size of your neural network. So it is like the number of your waves. It's, it's the sparsity of the neural network, and the uh, and the boundary here will, will looks like. This is approximation error because you, you are an S smooth function like the holder S space or sort of S space, it, the, the approximation bound will look like this. And here is the generalization bound. And then you optimize the number of your neurons and you can get a, a optimal non-parametric function estimation bound. Okay, so here I'm using a set of functions to estimate. So like these papers, I need to use random work complexity, not just that one simple uh, concentration in quality. So here, once you use the random work complexity, how I can convince you that the rate is one over n is actually using these figures. So, so the idea to get this is, uh, is called local random network complexity. It is saying that if I consider my U hat lies in a local ball, like the ball's radius is R. So if my U hat lies in this ball and this ball's radius is R, then you have a uniform concentration in this ball is square root over R over N. Okay. 
And uh, and uh, what I know is that my U hat uh, error between U hat and the U stars error is actually R because the U lies in this R, right? So then I want to know what is my R. So the simplest way is like my R should be at the same scale as this one, right? Because one is the ES inverse and another is E inverse. So so you are you can guess that they are their distance is some square root over R over N. So you will have square root over R over N equals to R. To solve this equation, then you will get a fast response. So this is called local random local complexity. It is saying that I consider the, the localized set. The localized set here, the T is always, it is a, in the paper, they say it's a general uh, formulation, but we always choose it as my loss function. So if I choose it as my loss function and I have a local upper bound for the local and more complexity, and then the generalization bound will always give by this fixed, the solution of these fixed point equations. Okay, so what's the difference between estimating a function using this local random complexity and using a uh, and and solving a PDE using this local random complexity? So I have said that the t here is always the loss function. So for the function estimation, the set here is always localized using L2 norm. But if you are solving a PDE, like if you are using deep freeze method, the, the localized set here is actually H1 norm. So if you, you are a physically informed neural network, the norm here is actually H2 norm. Okay, so this, this is the difference. So the localization tricks, they have different versions of proofs. So I listed here are some standard, uh, uh, some interesting proofs also developed recently and uh, I want to say is that for the PDE problems, you might uh, carefully select different ways to prove it. Uh, as an example, for, for these papers, they need some convexity of your empirical laws. So I think for decrease method and pain, you can do it without boundary condition, but with the boundary condition, you, you can't use this paper. So in our paper, we doesn't use this easiest way to prove it. And 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 the, for the local random complexity, there is a very, very very strong assumption is that all the functions in the function space should be in L infinity to think that I'm, I'm not in H1, it is my, but lies in the space, like the holder space, then I can use the local and more complexities proof. So he, uh, also the noise here should be bounded. So here the two papers want to break these assumptions. And uh, for this one it is break the assumption on noise. So, so they are using it for Gaussian noise. And, and for this paper, they want to break the, uh, this assumption. I think the assumption may be good for estimating a function, but it's not, not a good a, a assumption for general PDE solver. So I think it's an ongoing work to see whether these papers can be used for PDE learning. Okay, so let's go back to our, let, let, let's go back to our uh, problem. So if I want to use a neural network local random complexity to give you the bound. Let me directly use the random complexity here. So because you are H1 norm, you can relax it to L2 norm. You can use the local random complexity bound built by before. So if you once you use this bound, I will tell you that the, the constant here is actually the number of your weights. And uh, and, and finally you will, you will get a bound like this. Okay. Um, so here is a detailed point, but I, I want to say is that for the for the real neural network, the L here will always become log of your epsilon. So you will have a log term here, but but for but for the uh, neural networks only PDE, we always use reduce case power. So because it's a smooth function for the reduce case power, the L here will becomes O1. I think this is the difference between our proof and the standard proof for real network and the parametric estimation. Okay, so uh, once you use this bound here and you plug in the, the previous error decomposition, you will find out that the rate here is actually not optimal. Okay, why? So, okay, so this is this is what I get for the for sparse neural network. You will always have a local and based on the size of the neural network, and then you can do the uh, balance there. Okay, so, but I will tell you that the, the local random complexity is actually not good. It's because, uh, so here, if I want to use the L2 norm instead of, uh, sorry, we want to use H1 norm localization instead of the L2 norm, for the gradients, we can't represent, uh, we can't have a very good 
link between the number of neurons with the gradient scale. Okay, so the 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 if I localize my function, you can see that my function here have some further bounds on gradients, but this can't give me very strong bound for the number of neurons. So this is this is why the local random complexity is good for estimating a function, but it's not good for estimating a PDE. So let's consider the, the, the standard wavelet or free basis here. So if you consider free basis, the Z you, you, you will not consider because Z is a position for wavelet. You just consider the J here. The J here is actually the different scales for the wavelet and for the free basis is frequency. So if you change your L2 norm to your H1 norm, what you will have is like, like you will have a further a further term here. So it's like for the for the free basis, it's frequency is like for a higher frequency, uh, for the higher frequency, the magnitude here will become smaller because it's an H1 norm localized, but not L2 loss normalized. So the space here will become much smaller. Okay. So if you if you go to your local random complexity bound, you will you 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 are you are from two JD's power to uh, two JD minus two's power. So you will have a further minus two improvement here, but we can't do this for sparse neural network. So I'm, I'm saying that the sparse neural network is not good, but I'm not saying neural network is, is not good because for neural network, you always have some implicit bias in not the sparsity of your neural network use. So maybe for neural network, we can have a very good bound. It's also an ongoing work. Okay, even you use Fourier basis, what we discovered is that if you plug in all of your bounds there, what you will get is actually a not an optimal bound. So, so, so the, the so the reason let, 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 let's see the uh, upper bound here. Okay, so so sorry sorry the bound I I have here is actually a little bit misleading because the bound here I have boundary conditions like this term is boundary condition and this term is for boundary condition so let us let's ignore this thing let's just focus on this thing and this thing okay sorry sorry for this confusion so even for the decrease method it's not optimal the reason is that uh, I, okay, so I, I I will not talk about the reason now, but for the later, then you will see the reason. The reason is that okay, you 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 have this d minus two improvement here here for the for the local random complexity for your functions, but actually you have a gradient term in your risk form. If you can, if if you remember the risk form have a gradient use to its power. So if you want to bound the random complexity of that term, you will, you will not have this minus two improvement here. Then you will lose this minus two improvement again. So the gradient approximation is actually harder than the, than the functional value approximation for empirical process. So that's the reason why the bound here is not optimal. Okay, so we know that uh, the free basis is actually a kind of kernel method and uh, several papers here shows that if you have a very smooth functions or you know the structure of your functions, you can always design better kernels or, or you're just using a kernel estimation, it can, uh, some kernel method can even beat neural network for some simple PDEs. The reason is that for uh, the, there is always some optimization error for the deep neural networks, but for the kernel tensor method, the optimization error can become very small. So if the function is actually very, very smooth, then you can use a kernel method to approximate it very efficiently. So there is also another motivation for us to understand the free basis, but the free basis is not practical for higher dimension, but we use it to, to uh, point out our ideas. And uh, once you go through the kernel regime, all the problem become a linear problem, so we can decompose the, the error here very easily. So let's see what happens. So let's use a Fourier basis view. Let's consider two estimators for this PDE. The first estimator is that you first estimate your right-hand side function f. Then I directly solve this PDE. Like I, I can solve this PDE exactly. Let's consider a very simple case. The case is that this is a square. It's a PDE all over a square. Then, the, then once you have an estimate of your Fourier coefficient, so the phi z here is your Fourier basis, and then the z here is your Fourier basis frequency. Then you can estimate your f z hat. f z hat is your uh, f z hat is your uh, estimated Fourier coefficient, and then you can directly write down the the formulation of your u, right? So 
so this is the first estimators. So the, the estimator is actually equivalent to estimate your F in H minus one norm and then solve this PD in all efforts. Like that doesn't consider the algorithm's uh, complexity. Let's just consider the statistic complexity, okay? So this is estimator one. And for the estimator two, it is that I can parameterize your U user using a free basis, right? Then I plug in this one into your decrease objective, like, like this is your decrease objective. Oh, sorry, I I, sh I I missed a gradient here. So because your your decrease objective is gradient of u squared, so here you will have a gradient over phi z. So I, I I lose a gradient here. So so if you if you plug in your decrease objective to this thing, you will find out that it is still a quadratic function over u z hat. So I can still write down this thing in a matrix form. Okay, let's write down all oh, oh, this is in matrix form, and uh, and you will find out that they have some different. So for the first one, it is that you get your F that hat, and then I directly inverse the PD. But for the estimator two, what you do is actually you also you have an implicit estimation of your of your uh, uh, Fourier coefficients of F hat. But the matrix I inverse, the matrix I inverse here is actually an empirical version of my gradients. So, so it's like it's, if you look this 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 fun, this this, uh, this matrix in in expectation it will become this one because this is the empirical version of the gram matrix of the gradients of the Fourier basis. If you write it down in the population sense, then you will get this one, right? So, so then you will know that the difference of of these two estimators is that this uh, this esti uh, one is using this. Uh, ground truth inverse matrix, but here I'm using an estimated one. And at the same time, so you can easily prove that the estimated one is optimal is because you are actually estimating the F in an H minus one, uh, in an H minus one, one norm and using Fourier basis to estimate is actually optimal in, in that sense. So the estimator one is optimal, but we have shown that using empirical process proof tells you that estimator two is not optimal. So you can you can you can bound the the difference between a hat and the, the this matrix here. Then you are sure that the, the variance here is actually not it is the this power, but not that uh, this minus two's power. Okay. So this is for this is for the uh, this is for the free basis view of the decrease method. It is showing that okay, it, the the this term will give you very very large variance, but so. So it's not optimal, but actually you can have optimal solutions. But here, let's consider what I get the random data is on F because I, I should have statistical query for F. But for this term, I just have the neural network, right? I just have my use that here. So actually you can have a better sampling of this, right? Because you can sample more data here, but I doesn't need any query for F. So this is our, uh, this is our this is our uh, modification of the uh, decrease method. We call it MDIM modified DRM. It is in that for this term, I can sample more data. For the second term, I just using this data, and you can balance the two variance here. So one is size this power, and one another is a size d minus two's power. As I have shown before, then you can you can know once you I, I, I have these relationships, then I can say that the modified decrease is actually optimal. Okay, so you can see if you have a very hard, large D or a large S, like the smooth function in high dimension, the 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 value here is actually very very small because you can see the D and S if both increase them well will decrease the error here. So it is saying that my n and the n, big n and the small n is actually uh, is actually uh, approximately linear relationship in high dimension. Okay, so we also do this experiment here. So you can see the left-hand side figure is the decrease master and for the right-hand side figure is actually notified decrease master. You can have better result and you can have a faster convergence rate, but uh, yeah. Okay. So, so this is the empirical uh, convergence rate here. I, I doesn't know why it's a little bit slower than the theoretical result, but actually it's faster than 0 0.5 as the previous theory said. Okay. 
So there is also a very good uh, question to ask is, can the neural network be optimal? So our, our solution is that for sparse neural network, we guess it's not, it's not optimal, but we don't give you the proof, but we, but we believe this. The reason is here. So for, because the complexity of the sparse neural network is actually the, the, the number of the weights. So here I have a four neurons and I can, I can have, so here I have four neurons and then I can have very large gradients, but very small L2 norm. So, so, so for this epsilon, you, you just increase, you, uh, sorry, you just decrease your epsilon to zero, then you will have very oscillated solutions using very, very, very small numbers of neurons. So the sparsity of the neural network may be a very good complexity for you to estimate a function, but actually it's not good to estimate the gradient of the function. So that's, that's I would guess why the sparse neural network is actually not optimal for solving a PDE. Okay, there is also another observation. Maybe this slide is, is a little bit uh, uh, not organized or not well organized, but I will tell you this thing very carefully. So it is like for the noise term. So for all the proof in my proof for the deep breath method, we assumed that you get the clean app, not the random app. Because if you want to get your a random f, you will consider the effect of your noise. So let's consider the cosi i is your, the cosi i is your noise and the, the f is actually your estimators. Like the, this is the covering, covering of your estimator spaces and the f hat here is your estimator. So you want to bound this, this thing, this product. So you can, you can use the normalize the uh, empirical process, which, 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 is known, which is known as a very popular way to prove one over n square root, uh, one over n fast rate. So, you, so once you use this way to prove, you can see what's, what's in the dominator here is actually the L2 norm of your function, right? So it will go back to the L2 norm localized and local random complexity, but not H1 norm localized random complexity. Uh, this is a very sad story, but Actually, what we guess is that um, the rate here is not optimal is because we are using the empirical process way to prove it, but not using a better way. Maybe there is a better way. It's because for the Fourier basis view, like I have introduced in the previous slide, you can see for Fourier basis, you, you, if you use this empirical process proof, you will get the same, same result here. But actually for the Actually, if you if you if you do all the things here for the uh, for the free basis, you actually will get the optimal rate. So for the free basis for the deep freeze method, you can still get the optimal rate. But here, I don't know why. If you use the empirical process, you can't get the optimal rate here. Okay. Here is also another small observation is that if you use PIMS method, your objective function, let's consider it's a square root of uh, sorry, it's a, it's a square of your uh, final loss, right? So it's always positive. Even in the empirical version, it's always positive. But for the deep freeze method, the empirical version is actually gradients over some points and uh, and are uh, fitting of functions on uh, uh, other points. So for the for the empirical deep freeze method, the objective function can be very can be negative or even not lower bounded. It can be minus in infinity. So this is another view of Mm, maybe the deep freeze method will have worse generalization error. So I think this is ju just an observation, but I can't say anything about it very precisely, but I think this understanding is very useful. So here is takeaway of today's talk. It is like we introduce a non-parametric statistics view of the numerical PDE. We give lower bound, upper bound, and the and for modified decrease method and ping, we say that they, they are matched. So this also gives us some new constraints to design function spaces and objective, func and objective functions. So what we need to consider is actually not random complexity, but a localized one, and also the Sobolev norm localized one. Okay, the sparsity of the weight is also not a good measurement for the complexity of gradients. So, so if we want to design so I think it's very important to design some regularizations. So we should to find out some meaningful regularizations for machine learning based PDE solvers. So here is our paper, machine learning for elliptic PDEs, fast rate generalization bounds, neural scaling law and minimax optimality. It is available on archive. So you can see the draft here.
Okay. So for for the for the community, I would like to say if you want to de design a neural PDE solvers, you might have this recipe here. So so first find out the lower bound using the final method, and then you do a loss decomposition into approximation error and a generalization error. Then you are to see what what's the uh, brain side condition of your loss function, maybe it's piece power. So in our case, we are using some L2 draw matrix. So it's drawing convex, maybe for piece like partial, it's piece power. So it, it gives you different rates. So, and then you, you are to see whether your upper bound matches the lower bound. If it doesn't match us, you should consider some new ways. Okay, thank you for listening and I think I want to introduce the related papers. Uh, for the previous three papers, they are all papers for the slow rate generalization bound for the PDEs. It gives the first clear intuition of how we can do the error decomposition for different PDEs. And I think this paper by Jianfeng, Yulong, and Ming is, is considering the barren space instead of the sublet space. So they, they give a break curse of dimensionality result, but I would like to say there is some use saying that the barren space is actually embedded in some sublet space that it have, uh, it have these gradients. So if you plug in that S is some function, linear function of D into our bounds, you can also get some curse of dimensionality. But, but for the barrel space, the lower bound is still unknown. I think it's a very good open question to answer. And uh, for this paper, it's actually solving much MP equations. So they are estimating the transport maps. They get very similar results as our paper. So this is a very, very, very important paper to inspire our results. And uh, for this slide, the first two papers are the two, two very good papers to consider non-parametric estimating a function using sparse neural network. And this is, this is the empirical paper to show that the neural skewing law is actually existence exists in the uh, in, in, in experiment. And uh, thank you for listening. And uh, I'm welcome to all the questions. Thank you.